So, hello everyone. My name is Raquel Black. I'm sorry, initially. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation and a co working manager here at Chains Labs. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. And first off, I'd like to give a brief introduction to Change Labs and for those of you who aren't already familiar with our organization. Here at Change Labs, we provide creative workspace tools, resources, and knowledge for Native entrepreneurs. Our goal and our mission is to provide, um, provide those things for you. One of the most popular questions, I'm sorry, my slide's freaking out here. Okay, is how do I start a business? <clears throat> All of our programs and services here are designed to help native entrepreneurs, change makers, vendors, and everyone else in between to both start up and strengthen their businesses. So if this is a question that you have, I have some information following this slide um, that I wanna share with you. One of the programs that we have is our business coaching. We offer free virtual 90 minute appointments with any of our coaches. Our coaches are available Mondays and they each have their own area of expertise depending on the kind of support you're looking for. We have a whole team of very bright and eager coaches such as Jessica Stago, the director of our business incubator. Um, we have Christine Laughter, the director of our kinship lending program, our finance director, Marsha Gray Eyes, and a couple of our other coaches, Cecilia So and Tim Deal. <clears throat> They're all very, very knowledgeable in their specialties and will be able to assist you where you are needing help with your business at any stage. <clears throat> From marketing to accounting and bookkeeping systems, or if you just need help with creating a business model or navigating the Navajo Nation systems for things such as your business site lease or registering with the Navajo Nation Business Regulatory, you can find more information or book an appointment on our link here, nativestartup.org slash events. And the next thing I'd like to talk about is our business incubator program. Change Labs runs one of the only native-led business incubators for native entrepreneurs in the United States, and we're here in the Northern Arizona area. Um, it's a 12-month program for entrepreneurs who want support and training on how to start and run your business on the Navajo or Hopi nations. The program is led by Jessica Stago, our Director of Business Incubations, and Change Labs will be accepting applications for the next round of entrepreneurs who want to participate in this program later this year. So if you're interested and would like assistance with your logo or website design, um, marketing, finances, go ahead and check out our website. Our link is here at uh, nativestartup.org slash incubator. Another question that we get is how do I create a website? Until we can go back to hosting open studio hours at our headquarters in Suba City, we'll refer you to our YouTube channel. We have over 40 videos. Um, recording sessions and discussions each designed for native business owners and all led by other native entrepreneurs and creatives. Our workshops cover topics like social media marketing, website design, um, doing business on the Napa Nation and others. It's an awesome and growing archive with shared knowledge from other natives and our ever growing network for those who really wanna see our native people prosper. Another great resource we have is our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I recommend that you check out those pages for updates as well. There are links that we post from many of our other partners that we have in our network, and they have a, a lot of great opportunities like grants and events that they host as well. <clears throat> I'd also like you to refer you to our link here for our listings of our resources that we share and update regularly, um, such as grants that are available to a lot of business owners and community members. Um, so I definitely recommend that at nativestartup.org slash resources. And then another question we get is how do I get help running my business? There are many aspects to being an entrepreneur and the question or solution that you may be searching for isn't always obvious, um, especially on the Navajo and Hopi nations. Here at Change Labs, one of our driving factors is kinship. Uh, building relationships among our communities and nations and how Change Lab can help there is through our co-working space. Um, for those of you who may be aware, uh, we did have a space in Tupa City over at the Moenkopi Legacy in campus for the past few years, but right now that space is not available. But our new construction on our new headquarters is currently underway. It'll be uh, developed over at the, uh, right next to the shop to uh, Tupper City Chapter House on Main Street. <clears throat> so starting later this year, we'll have our new co-working space available for you and some services that we'll be able to offer you are desk-based, Wi-Fi access, color printing, coaching sessions, et cetera. 
Uh, we'll also be, we also plan to bring back uh, monthly in-person trainings for those who are interested. The list goes on and we're constantly updating services that we can offer um, depending on, on, our, on our local entrepreneurs and our local small business owners' needs and wants. <clears throat> and we're really, really excited to bring that space to you guys. Next, I'd like to talk about res rising. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of native entrepreneurs that we have all over the world. And here at Chains Lab, we've been curating our own list of them. Currently, we have over 600 listings um, of native service providers or native made products that are out there. And if you're searching for any of that, you can definitely check that out on our site there. We have it as resrising.org. So definitely check that out. If you have any other questions, you can definitely reach out to me. My name is Raquel Black again. My email is here, Raquel at nativestartup.org. Before we get to our speaker here, I want to go over a few things on work, our workshop etiquette. Uh, we ask that everyone stay on mute during the presentation, but feel free to populate the chat box with any questions that you have, and we'll make sure to get to them before the session's over. And then a reminder that our session today is being recorded, and this session, along with all our past sessions and any of our future sessions, is going to be available on Change Lab's YouTube channel later this week. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Joseph Austin. He is a practicing attorney at the law office of Joseph Austin Esquire. <clears throat> and he's going to here to speak on all things business structures. So welcome, Austin. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Raquel. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Joseph Austin. Um, I'm going to give a presentation. It's titled uh, Lions and Tigers and Bears and LLCs. Um, came up with the title myself, and you'll see why I'm titling it this. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction um, about myself. I am a sheep herder, born and raised in Navajo Nation. Um, not not in this what you have seen, but just seen. Don't not not in that shit. Hey, um, those are my my clans. My mom is is Dakota from South Dakota, and my dad is Navajo. So I'm one of those mutts. I'm a, I'm Dakota and also Navajo. Uh, also, um, I recognized a, a few names uh, in in the room. Uh, Carol actually is here. Carol was actually my Navajo teacher when I was in college, and uh, Carol was also one of the people that that gave me my first job during the recession. <laughs> so uh, I thought it was interesting that that she's She's here. I just want to give a shout out to Carol, and and I see also a couple other names here. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm related to uh, a good a good portion of you all on the on the uh, on the chat here. So um, anyway, just uh, by way of background, my education. I have a bachelor's in business administration from the Eller College of Management at the University of Arizona. I also have my my law degree from the University of Arizona with a certificate of Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy. And then um, I thought I'd torture myself a little bit more and I'd go for that master's degree. So I got a master's of law in international economic law and policy. Also from the U of A, I'm, I'm a wildcat for life, you know, so I don't know if there's any wildcat fans uh, on, on the call, but you know, I'm a wildcat for life. You look at my resume at the U of A all the way down. Um, and I didn't stop there at the master's program. I decided to go ahead and do the doctoral program. So I'm currently in the dissertation phase of my doctoral program. I'm writing my dissertation on international trade between um, indigenous nations and also focusing on how native nations can become participants in the international economy and do international business. So I think that's the way forward. Um, I'm also the, the owner of the law office of Joseph Austin. Uh, I started that myself. I'm, my law office is, is duly registered in the Navajo Nation. Um, I'm a licensed attorney, so I'm licensed in the state of New Mexico, Navajo Nation, Pasco Yaqui, as well as Santee Sioux up in South Dakota. And so my office, we take cases, you know, in the state of New Mexico, uh, a, good, a good portion of our caseload it comes out of Navajo Nation. We, we do anything under the sun. So we do employment law, we do family law, um, estates and wills and all that kind of stuff. Um, anything that comes into our office that, that people might need help with, that's what we do. We also advise corporations, we represent corporations, uh, represent companies both on and off the reservation. Um, in addition, I also have a, uh, a, side, a side business, uh, it's a consulting business. We consult with Native Nations in Indian country on, um, on things like economic development and law and policy reform. So um, 
that uh, is an LLC and registered in Arizona. And that's Olea Slorson Austin. So I got two business partners that work with me on, on that company. I'm also the CEO and one of the co-founders of the ACES School. We're a 501c3 a nonprofit corporation in the state of Arizona. So, uh, and then in addition to all that, I also serve as an associate justice for the Salt River, Pima, Maricopa, um, Indian Community Court of Appeals up in Scottsdale. So they do a lot of things. And I, I think with my credentials, you know, I have a, a good grasp on, you know, uh, topics in business and, you know, how to register your business, how to incorporate and, you know, draft all the corporate documents, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you have any questions, I just opened up the, the chat box. Um, so with the chat box, I'm going to try to keep track of everybody's questions and I'll try to answer them, um, as I go through my lecture. Uh, one of them is asking for cooperative law. I'm not sure what that is. Um, maybe if, if you explain it to me, I probably would. Um, but I'm not sure what your question is asking, but I see cooperative law. Uh, did, did you want to ask a question in regards to that? I think it's Bijaba. Should I just unmute myself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, we're informal yeah, so, here. So. Um, so I work out of New Mexico, Cooperative Catalyst of New Mexico, um, and Navajo Nation is the only Native nation that I'm aware of that has cooperative statutes. And so we're always trying to find people who work in business development who are familiar with cooperative, um, Navajo Nation's cooperative business statutes. Okay, yeah. Um, most most of that, we're, we'll, we'll be familiar with it, so... Uh, anything having to do with Navajo law, uh, we're, we're pretty well versed in that, especially with Title V, which you know includes most of the, the corporation code and LLC statutes and all that kind of stuff. And even Title V-A, you know, the UCC, we're, we're pretty familiar with that. So yes. Um, and then probate, yes, I also do probate law in Navajo Nation. Um, unfortunately, you know, since the pandemic started, we see we saw an influx in a lot of the probate cases coming into my office. So, but yes, we are familiar with that. Let's get down to it. So here's the thing, before I start, I'd like to give people kind of like an overview of Indian country, right? Because this is, this is something that confuses a lot of folks, especially folks who, are, who might be non-native uh, non -native companies, you know, who are interested in doing business uh, in Indian country. Indian country is actually a legal term, and Indian country encompasses all the reservations in the United States. There, there are approximately 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. So a lot of folks don't even know that. You know, so a lot of folks in Arizona don't even know there's 21 uh, Indian reservations. I believe it's going on 22. And so there's a lot of people that that drive through Arizona not knowing that they enter into a, um, a, a jurisdiction like Navajo Nation. And so um, this is it, it can it can be an issue and it's some, something to consider as you're doing business in the state, whether you're doing business in on a reservation or you're doing business in the state. So they, there are different requirements. You know, if you're going to do business on an Indian reservation like Navajo Nation, there are registration requirements. I'm sure most of y'all on this on this call are, are familiar with that. You probably have businesses that are either registered in Navajo Nation or the state of Arizona. Um, but this is some of the things that that you know my office makes people aware of, especially when we're dealing with, um, uh, let's say, a corporation from the state of New Mexico who's looking to do business, you know, on Navajo Nation with, you know, like let's say the Navajo Nation government through procurement or um, they want to submit a, a request for uh, answer a request for a proposal or something like that. So this is the kind of stuff that we advise folks on that, you know, when you're doing business on a reservation, there are certain laws that apply. We do have our own statutes. We do have our own codes that will determine how you register your business. So just because you're registered in the, in the state of Arizona doesn't mean you're registered to do business in Pasquayaki or Salt River or, you know, Gila River, any, any stuff like that. Um, so just some quick facts. Again, there's 574 recognized tribes in the United States. That's a lot of tribes. A lot of folks don't know that. And that's that's not even counting the state recognized tribes. So we do have state recognized tribes as well. Um, and there you'll usually find those, you know, on the East Coast and the southern part of the United States. Um, about 20, 27 percent of the native population lives in poverty. And these are some of the statistics that you can actually, you know, Google. You'll find this in a lot of articles that are that are write about, you know, um, the standard of living and life on reservations. 20, 27 percent of the population lives in poverty. Um, only 17 percent of the native population has a post-secondary education. Um, homicide rates, any kind of rates that, that you look at when you're dealing with a reservation, it's, it's two or three times higher, right? So, I mean, you think about homicide two times higher than U.S. average when you're dealing with the reservation. And, and you know, one of the more devastating statistics is, you know, Native women are three times more likely to be sexually assaulted 
in their lifetime compared to any other group in the United States. And so we see suicide rates, you know, two and a half times higher than the national average, you know, and we have the highest rates, of diabetes, heart disease, you know, liver disease and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, this is life on the reservation. And, and there's a reason why I'm telling you these statistics. The Navajo Nation. Navajo Nation is bigger than a handful of states. Navajo Nation is bigger than some countries. Navajo Nation is actually the, almost the size of Ireland. You know, it's even bigger than the, the country, Costa Rica. And so this is the map of Navajo Nation. You guys, you guys know what it's like, those of you who are from Navajo Nation. So we, again, you know, there's, there's a huge market on the reservation for products and services. And that's something to keep in mind. Navajo Nation overlays state of New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. It's 27,000 square miles. So if we were to be a state, it would be the, 40, the 42nd largest state in the United States. The, the EIN, I'm going to get to that in a bit, Aaron. So I, I, that, that, that's an interesting little topic there. Um, if, I, if I forget, just type it in um, to the chat again, and, and I'll address that as we go along. Um, so Navajo Nation is the largest tribe in terms of land mass and populations over 400,000 enrolled members. So I don't know if you all saw the, the news headlines about a year ago. We're actually the largest tribe in terms of land mass and population. We knocked off Cherokee Nation. Uh, so go Navajo Nation. Oh, and then half of us live on the reservation. Then you have those folks like myself, you know, who live down in Tucson, who, you know, go back and forth, you know, between their home on Navajo Nation and, you know, the city that they live in. And that's common that you see that, you know, with, with uh, especially some of the younger generations, you know, working off the reservation, but also still maintaining a residence there. So here's the question. If life is so bad on the Indian reservations, why should you do business on one? Um, does anybody want to want to take a shot at that? What if you're if you're a business registered Navajo Nation? Why are you doing business on the on Navajo Nation if life is so bad? Things are so terrible, right? You know, we always hear people always complaining. You know, the presidential candidates go up there talk about how they're going to make life better. You know, if if things you saw the statistics, if things are that bad, why would you want to do business on on a reservation? Anybody want to want to put their input in on that question? I think. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, I think it's um, the whole reason to start businesses is to solve um, to, is to solve local issues, and is to solve a problem. And I think a lot of Navajo people are wanting to solve problems in all of their in all of their um, communities. Right, and that's that's Swarovski. It's good. It's good to hear you again, Swarovski. <laughs> it's good to see a, a familiar name. Uh, Aaron Aaron is talking about you know there's a. Uh, there's opportunity everywhere. Uh, Kristen is saying there's possibility of economic development. And uh, if you get services from non-natives, they tend to charge higher prices. Indian owned by Indian, it's everywhere. There's a market, right? So that's what we're talking about. There's, there's opportunity. Yes, things might be bad on the reservation, but there's opportunity on the reservation as well. When you look at the, the different markets on Navajo Nation, I mean, really, when you think about it, you know, most of the Navajo folks who live on the reservation, they have to go into the border towns, right? They have to go into Flagstaff, Gallup, I mean, I lived on, I was born and raised on Navajo Nation. I did the same thing, you know, when we were kids, you know, my, my mom would drive us to the, to the local Walmart, you know, and, uh, and Gallup, which we lived in Winter Rock. So we'd make a trip into town, you know, we, we go to Walmart, believe it or not, the Walmart in Gallup is actually one of the most successful Walmarts in the United States. And that's all because of Navajo money. So, and, you know, you see a lot of businesses who will set up you know, on the border town, in a border town somewhere, Flagstaff and um, uh, Farmington, Gallup, you know, towns like that. And you'll see that a lot of those, a lot of those business, they do very, very well because of Navajo money. And so people drive hours just to get the basic necessities. But, you know, like, like Aaron was talking about and some of the folks in the chat, there's a market for almost every good and service on the reservation. We need everything, right? I mean, we, you know, we need the toiletries, we need uh, food products, you know, not just any kind of food products. We need, you know, the whole foods kind of, you know, products. We need the farmer's markets. We need everything up on there. And when a retailer sets up, sets up on the reservation, it does extremely well. And the, the most notable example I always point to is Dollar General to a city. When that Dollar General opened up, it did phenomenal. Again, it was one of the most successful Dollar Generals in the United States, again, because of, because of Navajo money. And so when we empower Navajo entrepreneurs you know, to pursue different business uh, endeavors on the Navajo Nation, you know, it's the people. You put, you put the, the future of the community, of the nation, in the hands of the people. 
you know, they control what kind of products and services are rendered to the community. You know, when you're a business owner, for instance, if you're selling, you know, if you're a retailer for, let's say, food, uh, for any kind of food products, you know, you can control what kind of food is on the shelves that people buy, right? I mean, you go into any kind of bashes or something like that, you always see the, the baked goods that are up front, right? You see those donuts, you see those pies, you see the cookies and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's why we have some of the highest rates of diabetes and, and whatnot on the reservation. But if you were to be that entrepreneur, if you were to offer, let's say, you know, food products that you buy, you know, that are locally grown organic foods from some of the local farms. And there's a lot of farmland out on Navajo Nation. Yes, we do have a water problem, but there is a lot of agriculture and farming going on in the reservation. You control the destiny of your people. You control what goes, you know, what, what's going to be put on the dinner table, right? And so that's what this is about. And when you're, uh, when you're doing business on the reservation, the money stays on the reservation and you create jobs for your community. Right. And that's that's part of all of this, what we're talking about. So power to the people, power to Navajo entrepreneurs. <clears throat> Again, now the Walmart and Gallup, like I said, is one of the most profitable uh, Walmarts in the United States. There's actually a, a, an article written about, you know, the success of Walmart and Gallup and what contributes to it. But again, when you look on the reservations, you know, some of the most successful businesses are McDonald's and Burger King and Bashes. You know, these are all the American, um, the American uh, companies, American corporations. And, you know, some folks will open up the franchises and they, again, they do extremely well on the reservation. Now, when we're talking about doing business um, on the reservation, you know, a couple of things come to mind. You know, my local hometown is Kienta. You see the blue coffee pot, right? I, my grandma used to always take me to the blue coffee pot restaurant. It's iconic. You have Amigos, you know, Cafe. You know, then you have some of the, the other businesses that recently started. Uh, Mystical Antelope Canyon. They do uh, tours in, in Antelope Canyon. You have the Shushnet Eco Retreat. You know, we do business out of Copper Mine. You know, and then Yalta Telecom, a new business that is, you know, uh, trying to set up 5G uh, internet for all of Navajo Nation. These are all Navajo owned, uh, Navajo owned small businesses. Okay, so again, when you drive through Navajo Nation, why do you see so few small businesses, you know, in some of the towns? And, you know, why are there no cities, you know, that you would see in a state? Phoenix or Albuquerque or something like that. You know, what's going on on the reservation? Why is it that things are the way that they are? Um, there's a couple, you know, explanations for that. You know, most of that is legal in nature. You know, I really won't touch too much on that. But the Navajo economy, again, when you think about the economy, there's two types of sectors. There's the private sector and the public sector. Now, the public sector is basically anything, any kind of enterprise that's owned by the government. And, you know, this is what you see with Twin Arrows, this is a Fire Rock, you know, casino over near Gallup. And you have NTUA, you know, with this new building, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and then um, you also have uh, Navajo Oil and Gas. So, and then, you know, the private, the private sector, right? These are things that, again, are they're owned, they're, 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 the private sector is comprised of small businesses that you see out there. So any kind of small business, usually LLCs, those are the private sector in the, in the in the economy. And so, like most Indian reservations, Navajo Nation's economy is actually propped up by public sector. So you'll see that, you know, the Navajo economy um, really is propped up by its enterprises because it's the enterprises that open up jobs and opportunity for folks. You know, it, it pays people salaries and benefits and that kind of stuff. It relies mostly on tribal enterprises, which, you know, it's not really the way that most economies operate around the world. You know, really, there's almost no private sector, no formal private sector on Indian reservations. However, Navajo Nation has a large informal private sector. And what I mean by that is flea markets, right? When you go, there's a flea market every Saturday in different towns all across Navajo Nation. Those flea market vendors are entrepreneurs. Those flea market vendors, they might not know it, but that they're actually the private sector in Navajo Nation. They're just not registered. And because of that, again, we call them the informal private sector. So that's that's what we're that's what we're looking at. Now, for those of you um, who are looking to start a business, right? Let's let's get down into the into the main part of this of this lecture, this presentation. So, those people who initially want to go into business, right? I mean, they some people think it's a you know, they, it's a very complicated process. You got to do all this filing with the government. You know, you got to get set up with different legal paperwork, legal documents. Yes, you know, you can do that. But also what a lot of people don't realize is that you can also do business 
uh, as a sole proprietor. And so most people actually start out as sole proprietors. And as being a sole proprietor, you don't have to file any documents. You don't have to make any major declaration. All you got to do is you just take on your first job and start working, and then you're considered a sole proprietor. So there's there's no registration paperwork. There's nothing to fill out, no forms or anything like that. And in fact, most of the businesses in the United States, they're sole proprietors. And so these are the people who take on gig work. They're freelancers. You know, I mean, you see a lot of freelance photography out there. You know, that's what it is. You start, most people start out as a sole proprietor. But as you start to grow your business, as your business starts to grow, you see more cash flows coming in, coming into your business. You have more clients. You start to grow. You might need an office space or something like that. Then what you usually try to, what you really want to do is you want to start uh, as an LLC. And so again, you know, you start as a sole proprietor, then eventually you'll probably grow into an LLC. If your profits keep, you know, increasing and then you get all these people working for your company and all that kind of stuff, then you might want to consider forming a corporation. You know, you want to have offices and branches all around, you know, the United States or reservations or something like that. You know, that's how it is, is a lot of these business structures, it, it's an evolution, right? It's like a, a spectrum. You start with a sole proprietor, LLC, corporation, you know, and then you grow from there. That's usually the way that it happens. Not all the time, but that's usually the way that, that businesses evolve. So now here's the thing. Here's the question that I'm going to ask uh, the audience. Now, you, a lot of you might have started as a sole proprietor. Now, what would be some of the reasons for you to formalize your business? As in, why would you want to register your business? Does anybody want to want to answer that question? Sole proprietor, why do you want to register your business? I mean, you're a sole proprietor. You don't you don't really have to. Again, you don't have to file any paperwork. You can operate a sole proprietor. Many people do. But why would you want to have a, a separate entity like an LLC? And you can unmute yourselves. Feel free to to throw in your your input. So we have Jesse Bennett saying, "Protect yourself." Aaron, yeah, hello to Sarah. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Uh, just wanted to uh, say uh, it, it comes with legitimacy when you're working with other organizations. Legitimacy. They the, yeah, they see the okay. LLC part of it, and they uh, well, immediately recognize that you're you're more legitimate. Okay, and so I guess my my question to you would be: so if you're if you're working as a sole proprietor, does that mean that you're you're less legitimate uh, than an LLC? Yes, I would say so. Okay. Um, and so, you know, as a sole proprietor, you know, you can actually get yourself business cards, you can, you know, you can have a logo, you can have a company name and all that kind of stuff, pretty much similar to an LLC. The only difference, you know, is that you have to file paperwork as an LLC. And so there probably, there probably isn't, uh, you know, there probably isn't, it probably isn't a question of legitimacy. That's probably a perceived, you know, uh, legitimacy that you're talking about that, you know, when you're a sole proprietor, people probably perceive you as not being legitimate. And, you know, Carol is kind of throwing in, you know, and again, along those same lines, the reason to start an LLC is to become official and be known for your business. And again, you know, that's stuff that you can actually do as a sole proprietor as well. I see Jesse's throwing in a, a lot of uh, comments here. Jesse, you want to, you want to comment on this one? I think what um, I saw in the beginning was everyone was saying to protect um, personal assets apart from yeah. the business. Yep. Okay. So protect your assets. Exactly. And so um, you want to protect yourself. That's one of the main things. When you start doing business, let's say that you start negotiating contracts. Now there's a difference yeah. between negotiating, let's say a contract um, as a sole proprietor and an LLC, right? Uh, oh, Jesse, you raised your hand. You want to go ahead and chime in? Joseph, I just wanted to um, interrupt here. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to add on to that, uh, to become official and be known for your business. Uh, the other thing that I'm working with, um, you know, starting up business with native owned um, constructions and as well as um, um, people in the co construction business, they have to be bonded. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think you're kind of going that direction with your, um, your talk about, you know, you have to be able or something you have to keep yourself covered so i think in order for you to get bonded you have to have some type of paperwork right. um, in order to be and you have to be certified as well so i think that's where the bonding issue comes in so right. we're at that state with the business that i'm actually helping right now right right 
Exactly. And again, you know, the construction, the construction businesses are very unique in themselves too, because there's actually a whole different set of laws that actually pertain to construction companies. Uh, and even, even uh, in regards to, to lending and, and financing for construction companies, there's a whole another set of laws and regulations that, that deal with that. But yes, you are correct, Carol. Uh, Jesse, you have your hand raised. Uh, did you want to uh, go ahead and contribute? Sorry, this is my first Zoom. No worries, <laughs> no worries. Figure it all out. Uh, so um, I don't think uh, it's all how you uh, how you present yourself as a business. Mm -hmm. um, sole proprietors can present themselves as very professional and very reliable. And uh, you know how you do that is through your media and the platforms that you connect with your your clients or your demographic. You know, mm -hmm. um, I have always been a solo person and really. For the longest time, I was in the private sector, and then I decided I'm going to start a business, you know, and I did all the paperwork and, you know, as a sole proprietor. But a lot of people, when they called me, I presented myself very professionally to the point that they thought I was a corporation and that I had a, <laughs> I had a whole team of people working with mm -hmm. me when it was just me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and then, of course, you know, once you start, uh, you know, having a clientele and people, you know, referring you, uh, you know, it, it's that's your... Um, you know, that's where people share their uh, experience with you and give you reviews. And, you know, so uh, you, you build a, um, you know, a nice, uh, I, I don't know, someone help me here. <laughs> you just a rapport or, you know, right. you just, people trust you. You build trust, goodwill right. or whatever, you know? And so right. I don't think it matters. But also these different um you know, levels of business, you know, all the way to corporation, all the way down to sole proprietorship, they all have benefits, you know, of their own. And mm -hmm. a lot of them have to do with taxes and how you're able to, you know, obtain money and how you, how you're supposed to record it. And, you know, you definitely a lot of paperwork depending on what you choose to do. So yeah, I, um, I'm I'm ready. I'm ready to get my LLC started, and uh, I can't wait to connect with you outside of the Zoom because uh, I have some 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 big things I've been working on. <laughs> right, right. So. Sounds good. Sounds good. Appreciate Thank it, Jesse. Uh, yeah. Again, feel free to contribute throughout the throughout the lecture. Everybody, you know, in the presentation, feel free to throw in, you know, some of your comments. You know, again, I I don't claim to be the know all to any of this. You know, I just I know the legal perspective. I run businesses myself, so that's where I'm coming from. We all we can all learn from each other. But again, you know, let's let's get back on on topic here. The sole proprietor. Again, here's a here's a picture of sole proprietors. You know, most of them are going to be sole proprietors. You know, the flea markets out in Gallup, right? Everybody's probably been to the flea market in Gallup. Most of those folks. Are sole proprietors. Now, the difference between a sole proprietorship and an LLC is going to be with an LLC, you're able to protect your assets. And those are some of the first comments that were thrown out there. That would be the reason to go from a sole proprietorship to an LLC, protect your personal assets. Now, again, when you think about when you negotiate contracts, right, you're a business, you're a sole proprietor. Let's say that, you know, I'm in the, um, I'm an electrician, I'm a sole proprietor. Right. And so I want to start doing business and, you know, I advertise out there. I get my first call. Somebody says, hey, can you come, you know, to South Tucson and uh, fix my fix my my outlet that broke? Sure. I'll go ahead and do that. And so these are my rates and I have an invoice ready to go, you know, for the work I performed, all that stuff. I go down there, you know, I do the work and I invoice, you know, the client. And so the, here's the thing is that as a sole proprietor, uh, the clients that you handle is going to be on an individual basis and the client, as in your personal assets are at risk. Let's assume that I perform the electrical work for this client and something goes wrong and let's say the, you know, an outlet catches fire and then the home burns down because I was negligent in my, in my repairs of the outlet. So who's liable for that? You know, is, can I say that, oh, well, you know, I have a, a business called Joe's, uh, Joe's Electricians, so my company is liable. It's actually not true. It's not, not true because, again, I'm a, I'm a sole proprietor, meaning that my personal assets are at stake. There's no separate business entity. If you're to file as an LLC, you form a separate business entity, which removes, which basically separates your personal assets from that of the company. So let's say that, you know, I'm, I'm going to perform, you know, some electrical work for, you know, another client somewhere and I have an LLC. And I have all the company documents that, you know, I present to the client. Look, this is the work I'm going to be performing you, performing for you at this rate. 
you know, in the event, you know, that something happens, you know, my company is going to be responsible. I have insurance for my company, you know, to cover any kind of, uh, let's say that any kind of lawsuits that might come my way. You know, that's the whole point of it is that if you enter into contracts with somebody as an LLC, you do so as Joe's electrical shop and also, you know, the client. Meanwhile, if you're a sole proprietor, you are the named party in that contract, which means that your personal assets are at risk, you know, in the event of, you know, again, breach of contract or negligent work. So that's the main difference that we're talking about here. And here's the thing, guys, with a, with a sole proprietor. We, this is one of the biggest myths in that nation. Some people think that just because you're a sole proprietor, you don't have to pay taxes. You absolutely have to pay taxes, even if you're a sole proprietor. So those folks who are actually selling stuff, you know, out in the flea markets, they do have to pay taxes on their sales. Right. And so a lot of people think they don't. And a lot of people don't really. But here's the thing is, as your business grows, you're going to show up on the radar of the tax commission or the IRS. They're very good at doing that. I don't know how they do it, but I've had clients, you know, who are sole proprietors and, you know, they're making sales and all that kind of stuff. Pretty soon they get hit with a, some kind of letter from the IRS or the tax commission saying that they owe taxes because they did not pay tax on the sales. So, again, just because you're a sole proprietor doesn't mean you don't have to pay taxes. You absolutely do. So just keep that in mind. And let's talk about the, the LLC next. Um, oh, before I get there, here's the thing. So you're, you're, you're a sole proprietor. Now you're ready to move on, right? What are some of the options that you have as a business? Choose your poison. I'm not talking about these guys, although they are a good band. I like Brett Michaels. But here's the thing. The different options that you have. LLC, low profit LLC, which is also called an L3C, which is an interesting entity that I'm going to go over. You have corporations that you can choose from, B Corp, C Corp, and even an S Corporation. Uh, and again, there's some nuances with that. And I want to talk about that S Corporation a little bit more later. You also have a nonprofit corporation. You know, let's assume that your main, your main uh, goal is really not to make money, but your main goal is actually to serve the community, to, you know, to offer services for the public good. Well, a nonprofit might be something that, that you might, you might want to look into. But again, just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you're tax exempt. A lot of people think that, you know, you, you organize as a nonprofit, now you're tax exempt. That's not true. You actually got to get a 501c3 uh, confirmation letter from the IRS, then you'll be considered tax exempt. You also have a limited partnership. Right? There's different kinds of partnership levels, but, you know, that's usually you see that with some of the professional uh, services, you know, like a law firm. For instance, you have limited partnerships, you have general partnerships, um, and you even have a, a partnership uh, LLCs that are out there. So there's, there's, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, any other states on the East Coast, they all have different entities that you can choose from with different requirements. But generally, they all have some of the same elements, uh, part of them. And then also a foreign entity, which is just basically, you're already established as an LLC. Now you want to do business, let's say, in Navajo Nation. You have an LLC in Arizona. You want to do business in Navajo Nation? Well, you're going to have to register as a foreign entity. And so that's, again, some of the stuff that, that we're going to cover later on. So let's start with this first one. Now, um, the LLC, when you're, when you're trying to decide, you know, again, which one of these things that you want to choose, which one of these businesses, what are some of the things that you have to think of? And again, I have a whole list of things that, you know, when, when I have clients that come to my office and they say, well, you know, I, I want to move on from a sole proprietorship or here's my business idea, you know, what's your recommendation? And I said, there's, there are a ton of considerations um, that, that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about which business entity that you want to choose. There's nothing wrong with going from a sole proprietorship to a C corporation. You know, it's not like you have to go from some sole proprietor to LLC and then C corporation and work your way up. No, you don't have to do that. Assuming that you have a business model or business idea, you know, that will warrant a C corporation, you can absolutely jump into a C corporation. And again, some of the things you want to think about is, you know, how many business partners do you have? Is it just going to be yourself or do you plan on having business partners? Uh, what are you going to be offering to your customers? Is it going to be a service based company or is it going to be products? What kind of products are you selling? Uh, who are you going to get those products from? Uh, do you have a, uh, um, do you have customers or are you looking to do something for the betterment, betterment of the community? Again, this is where we see the, the low profit LLCs and the nonprofits might come into play. So it, it might be that your, your main goal is not to make money, right? Which is a little bit odd because when I was in business school, I actually learned, learned uh, about you know, business and economics and finance at the Eller College of Management from this guy who was like, I'm pretty sure he was about 87 years old. And the first thing he taught us on day one is he said, you go into business 
the main, your main goal is to make money, right? That, that's what I was taught in my business school. The main, go, main goal is to make money. And he would say, you can, you can cloak it as I want to offer, you know, great customer service. I want to offer superior products, but your main goal is to make money because without money, you can't survive as a business. And so it's, it's a very controversial statement to make, especially in this day and age, you know, to say that your main goal is to make money, but it should be at the top, right? I'm not saying money is everything. I'm not saying become greedy people and rip up the environment and do everything that you need to do to make that dollar. But I'm saying that money income is a big uh, part of doing business. So, but again, these days we, that's why we see things like nonprofits and low profit LLCs. And so how big of an operation do you expect? Are you expecting, you know, again, can you work out of your home? Or is this going to require you to set up a factory, you know, and have, you know, 50 employees working underneath you? You know, what kind of capital do you need for that? What kind of equipment do you need? Do you expect large cash flows coming in? Or do you expect to, you know, maybe pull in, you know, 20,000 a year? You know, is there room for you to grow? What does your market look like? Competition, you know, do you need protection of your assets? Do you have investors? Are you going to do something like a, a, a venture capital, right? Let's say that you have people who are willing to invest in your company. You know, well, you know, with an LLC, you can't do investments through an LLC. You might want to do that, you know, through a C corporation, right? Um, and so these are all the things that come into play. And again, one of the biggest things is taxes. All these entities are taxed in different ways. So that's one of the main things that we look at is taxes. And when, I, when we advise clients, that's one of the main conversations that we have is taxes. So again, uh, at this point, does anybody want to throw in, you know, again, some of the things that you think about, you know, when you're, when you're wanting to, to choose an entity? Um, I see Lillian has, has uh, put in a comment in the chat. That, Lillian, do you want to want to expand on, on your comment? Sure, thank you. This is definitely helpful. Um, <clears throat> I work primarily within the nonprofit sector, um, particularly on the Hopi Reservation, and have also been in conversation about, you know, developing, potentially developing um, co-ops, cooperatives, particularly food cooperatives. And I see that, you know, there's a variety of different um, strategies that folks on the reservation are, are uh, using to either build businesses or to create and generate services for um, specific communities or um, villages on the reservation. And so one thing that I'm uh, curious about is um, because, you know, on the reservation, we face a certain economic reality that may be uh, different from the larger um, Western uh, sector, urban or rural sector, um, mm -hmm. where folks are living primarily either at or below the poverty line. Um, I see that although well-intentioned, there are businesses popping up, but then the actual cost of goods or services are beyond the scope of, um, of communities that that are being served. Um, and so therefore um, businesses are primarily prioritizing border towns or off reservation um, also to make money. But, you know, I think um, that puts our communities at a disadvantage as well. So I'm just wondering, you know, and you don't have to answer this right now, but if there's resources or conversations that are being generated um, regarding the ethics of, um, of making money or, or how capitalism impacts um, or, or as we're developing businesses and choosing our, our poison, um, what are some of the, the things to consider um, in terms of serving um, rural communities that are at or below the poverty line? Right, and, and that's, that's a great question. You know, the, the ethics that, that are in play, you know, are there, are there ethics? I mean, you know, you have some, some regulations in regards to, you know, businesses that, that go green, right? And those are environmental considerations that, that you talk about. Uh, there's also, you know, laws out there in regards to price gouging. We saw those laws come into play, you know, during the pandemic. But, you know, mo most of what, what you're probably referring to is probably going to fall under in the area of ESG, environmental, social, and governance, you know, and, and benefit corporations, you know, that uh, what we're talking about, again, you go to business school, this is something that, that they're teaching these days is social or, or uh, corporate responsibility, right? Ethics in business. There are ethics in business, and you learn about those things, you know, when you go to business school. But also, you know, when you're out there doing business, it's some of the stuff that, that you consider as a business owner, right, is doing business the right way, doing business ethically. And so, again, th that's probably going to tie into, you know, our discussion as we keep going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover B corporations as well as the low-profit LLC 
And that's, that's, again, that's a lot of what you see, you know, when you're dealing with those two types of entities. So, uh, you know, during that time, you can, you can chime in um, if you'd like and ask, you know, the questions during that, and, you know, hopefully we can, we can answer some of your, your questions. Okay. So here's the thing guys is again, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that when you're doing business, one of the first things that you do is build a business plan. Uh, because again, when you think about what kind of entity do you want, and you know, when people come to my office and say, "Can you help me move forward?" One of the first things I ask for is a business plan, right? Is your business plan will tell me everything I need to know to help you choose that type of entity. You know, do you, you know, you're going to require an LLC? Or you're going to require a corporation. Well, what does your business plan say? Because it tells you know what you're going to be selling, you know what the market looks like, you know where you're going to be doing business, all that kind of stuff. It should be in your business plan. So, what does your business plan say? That's the main question that, that I have, you know, for some of the people that come to my office. Now, the limited liability company, let's start with this one. This is what I call the Ford F-150 of business structures. They're everywhere. It's very, very common to see LLCs. Not as common as a sole proprietor, but LLC is next on the list. This is the most common one that you see out there. Now, an LLC, also known as a limited liability company, this is a separate legal entity. Right. And again, you start, you want to start as a sole proprietor. Now you want to protect your assets because you're making more money, right? When you make more money, you have more clients, your risk increases as you do business. And so at that point, you might want to consider forming an LLC, which is a separate legal entity that separates yourself and your business. So you don't have to worry in the event that, you know, something happens. Like I said, if I do negligent repair, let's say I'm an automotive vehicle, I'm repairing a car and then the car, you know, breaks fail and then somebody gets into an unfortunate accident. If I'm a sole proprietor, I would probably be liable for that in a wrongful death action. Um, even a product's liability suit, I might be liable you know, as a sole proprietor. And so when you have your business, your business will shield your personal assets, meaning that you know, somebody's going to bring a lawsuit against you. And I can tell you, one of the things you can always count on at some point in doing a business is a lawsuit. You will get sued at some point during the life of your business is just part of doing business. So you want to make sure again that as you grow, as you're dealing with more with transactions that are, you know, they might be, you know, a couple thousand dollar transactions or, you know, you were doing very well. It might be, you might be talking a couple million if you're a construction company. You want to make sure your assets are protected. So in the breach of a, let's say that a breach of contract happens or negligent repair, negligent work, they're not going to be taking your house. They're not going to be laying claim to your car or anything like that. You can rest assured. And so again, LLC is a separate legal entity. Now with an LLC, you can have one owner, you can have two, you can have a hundred owners if you want. These, these folks are called members of an LLC, right? And so you, people can own an LLC or another business can own an LLC. It's pretty common to see a corporation you know, own an LLC. Um, and even now, there's this new entity, you know, it's not really new, but you know, it, it, was, it probably came about in the past you know, 10, 15 years, you see professional LLCs. And so PLLC, and again, you see that with doctors, you see that with lawyers and stuff like that, operates pretty much like an LLC, but involves professionals who are licensed in that jurisdiction. For instance, attorneys who are licensed to practice, you know, in the state of Arizona, you know, they might get together and form an LLC, and that's going to be the PLLC that you see. Okay. And so LLCs, LLCs are what's called pass-through entities for federal income tax purposes. And again, this is some of the things to consider, right? You want to start an LLC. Well, how are tax, how does the IRS uh, treat LLCs when, for, when they're going to be uh, taxing them, right? They're pass-through entities. Uh, what that means is they're disregarded. All, any kind of income that you generate through your LLC, um, that's going to be passed through onto your individual tax return. So any kind of profit that you generate that's going to be reported usually on your 1040. So it's not that, you know, that your LLC pays taxes, you as the individual, the owner of the LLC, or let's say that you have two other people, you know, again, you're going to, you individually are going to pay taxes on that. You're going to put them on your individual tax returns. And so if it's just one person owning an LLC, it's considered a disregarded entity. If you have more than two people who own the LLC, then you're treated as a partnership for federal tax purposes, unless you or your partners elect to be treated as a corporation. I don't know why you would do that, but I'm sure there's certain instances where you know a company, an LLC, would want to be treated as uh, a C corporation for purposes of taxes. But usually the way it is is most LLCs are going to be passed through entities. Any profit you generate, any income is going to be reported on your individual tax return. Um, is there any questions on that? Okay, so how do you start an LLC? Um, 
again, every single jurisdiction, every state, any state that you want to start an LLC in, they're going to have their own laws uh, and regulations regarding how to do that. And so LLCs, the way that you do it, let's say, let's take Arizona, for instance. I know a lot of folks here are from Arizona, even New Mexico. I mean, every single state, uh, the registration of businesses are usually handled, handled through the Secretary of State's office. And Arizona, we have the Arizona Corporation Commission, right? They have a website online. You can go to Arizona Corporation Commission. You can Google it. That's where the place you're going to go to file the paperwork to start an LLC. The main paperwork that you need to file, the main document is called the Articles of Organization. Now, the Articles of Organization is going to contain, you know, the, the, usual, the usual stuff that you see, uh, you know, your address, name of your business, um, statutory agent, and all that kind of stuff. And so when you get that filed, and you know, once it gets approved by the Arizona Corporation Commission, then you're officially an LLC. And so usually, you know, the LLCs, any kind of name that you come up with needs to use uh, the acronym LLC or LTD, limited, depending on, again, depending on the regulations, you usually have to use, you know, LLC at the, at the end of your, your business name. Um, LLCs are governed by operating agreements. And so... If it's just you running the LLC, and let's say your operations aren't too big, uh, most folks will not have an operating agreement in place. Uh, the time that I usually recommend putting an operating agreement in place is, again, if you're, if you're kind of scaling up, and let's say that there's multiple members in the LLC, then I would highly suggest you put an operating agreement in place. And an operating agreement will basically govern the internal operations of your company. Right. So if I have uh, business partners, you know, let's say I do have two business partners in my LLC and let's assume that we're going to start, you know, operations and, you know, we need to hire managers, we need to hire employees and all that kind of stuff. And so an operating agreement is what we put in place to govern who's going to be doing what in the LLC, who's going to be the CEO, who's going to be the CFO, what about chief of operations, what are the managers going to be doing? Right. And then who is going to be responsible for running the day to day operations of the company and making decisions uh, regarding the company? All that is put down into an operating agreement. Even if people, let's say that members of the LLC want to want to put forward, let's say each business partner, you know, is going to be putting forward five thousand to invest in the LLC to get it up and running. Well, how do you handle those folks investments when you do that? Right. And if again, are we going to be are we going to be electing for a C corporation uh, tax? status when we filed with the IRS, or maybe we'll want to go towards an S corporation stuff, you know, again, that's governed by the LLCs, right? And who's going to be our statutory agent, right? Does everybody know what a statutory agent is? A statutory agent, you know, just for the purposes of those folks who aren't aware, a statutory agent is an agent of the company who will accept service of process paperwork on behalf of the company. As in, if your company gets sued, who does the person suing you, the plaintiff, who do they give the, the documents to, the court documents? It's going to be your statutory agent. Uh, they, they accept service of process. And there are certain jurisdictions. In fact, I'm sure all state jurisdictions require any court paperwork to be, to be served on the statutory agent. Otherwise, it's considered insufficient service of process. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Navajo Nation is interesting because if you start an LLC in Navajo Nation, they require your statutory agent to be a member of Navajo Nation living on the reservation under the Limited Liability Company Act. For Navajo Nation. And that actually poses uh, uh, quite a few problems for businesses who are looking to do business on Navajo Nation because they got to find a member of Navajo Nation that's living on the reservation to serve as a statutory agent. There's actually small companies out there in law offices like mine who actually offer that service as the company. You know, my office, you know, being out in Navajo Nation, I can serve as your statutory agent. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they charge fees in order to do that. So, operating agreement. So, um, let me pull up an example here because I see Aaron is asking for one. And, and lucky, lucky for you, Aaron, I already have this stuff uh, thought out. So I have some, some examples here of the operating agreement articles and corporation as well. Operating agreement. So this is what an operating agreement looks like. And I got permission from one of my clients to use their operating agreement, right? And uh, this, is, this is one of the operating agreements that my office um, helped with this company um, draft up and and you know put into place so again an operating agreement is not required 
is not required for an LLC. So don't, don't go thinking that you absolutely must have an operating agreement because it's not required under any regulations that I'm aware of. Uh, this is just solely for the purpose of helping you run your LLC when there's multiple actors and, and people uh, that are participating in your business. This is what you would usually see. And again, you know, we have article one formation, you know, that this is the name of your company. Is it a member managed LLC or is it a manager managed LLC? And again, the difference is that the people who own the LLC are called members, members of the LLCs. So it's synonymous with business owner. That's a member managed LLC when the people who actually own the LLC manage that business. Now, if you want to designate it to somebody else, um, if you want to designate running the business to somebody else, let's say a manager, then you designate that person as a manager, then that's considered a manager ma uh, managed LLC. And, uh, and again, Aaron, the, the main thing is that it becomes important, you know, to have an, an operating agreement when there's a, dis if, to, to number one, govern how things are going to work internally in your business. And it's usually when you have multiple members of the LLC, who's going to be doing what uh, in the event that there's a dispute between the members of the LLC, the articles of, uh, or, the, or the operating agreement is going to govern those disputes. And so a lot of the stuff, again, is kind of like a contract between your, your members, uh, but that should, this should clear up any kind of disputes that you have among the members of an LLC. And again, here's some of the, the articles that you have here. Formation, the duration, is it perpetual or is it gonna be for a specific time? Most LLCs, they're gonna be perpetual, meaning that they're gonna continue to exist until you file the paperwork to dissolve your LLC or wind up the business. And so uh, you have your, principal office, where are you doing business? You know, are you going to be doing business in Phoenix, Tucson, your principal office, that's where you're going to put down the address, statutory agent, again, who's going to be accepting um, court paperwork on your behalf, that's your statutory agent, what is your purpose and your mission, again, very important to have a mission statement for your company, what are you trying to achieve, even a vision statement, overall, where do you see yourself 10, 15 years down the road, that's not only part of your operating agreement, but that's also part of your business plan, right? So your business plan, again, is going to inform a lot of your operating agreement. So it's kind of a jumping off point. So business plan first, always make that, that business plan first, then we can start talking about your entity, and then file the paperwork. And then once all the paperwork has been approved, what other paperwork do you need in place? Do you need an operating agreement? Do you need employee manuals? Do you need contracts? You know, you're going to, you're probably going to be contracting with a lot of uh, uh, independent contractors. You might need 1099s in place, right? This is some of the stuff to consider. Now, here's what I was talking about, Aaron, article two, members, contributions, and interests. So, you know, again, you have multiple members of your LLC, you put down their names and their percentage that they own in that company. So if you have two people who are members of the LLC, they might have a 50-50% uh, uh, interest, each one of them. Or somebody might own 75% 75, 75 of the LLC and they retain uh, majority control over that company compared to somebody who has 25%, right? That's all broken down into your operating agreement. And again, do you, is there, are you going to allow additional members into your LLC? For instance, you know, me and my buddy, let's say we're doing business in, in our consulting company and we have somebody else who think is going to make a, a great asset to the company in terms of managing it and running it. Well, does our operating agreement allow that to happen? So that's something that you want to put in here. Capital contributions, again, you know, do you require contributions in order to become a member of the LLC? Are you requiring people, let's say, to invest 5000 10000 you know, anything like that? You don't have to, but if you do, you might want to spell out how that's going to be handled in your operating agreement. Um, as you do business, you become more successful. Are you going to require people to invest some of what they make? Again, everything that gets put into here. Allocations of profits and losses. Again, this is some of the major disputes that we usually see with multi-member LLCs as folks will argue about profits and losses. How do you distribute profits, right? All of that should be broken down in here. Are you gonna, are you gonna be doing with any of the profit that you make? Are you gonna be reinvesting that into the company? Let's say to purchase capital, to purchase equipment. All of that is broken down into here. Distributions, again, you would probably see the distribution stuff when you're dealing with an S corporation, but uh, you, again, usually most folks would just leave that out. Administration of company business. Again, who do we have here? CEO, CFO, 
chief operating officer, the members, managers? What about additional staff and employees? Are you going to be giving hiring preference? There's some jurisdictions like Navajo Nation that are going to require you as a business. One of the, one of the, uh, the requirements to doing business in Navajo Nation is you have to give preference to Navajo employees, right? You want to make sure that you comply with the Navajo Preference Employment Act when you're doing business on the reservation. You might want to put that in your operating agreement as well. You know, you might want to put, you know, let's say you're doing business off the reservation uh, as a private company and, you know, you get people that are applying for jobs. Do you want to give, you want to give preference, you know, to Navajo, Navajo applicants? We do at my LLC. That's what we do. Uh, contractors, subcontractors. Again, if you're going to be subcontracting with another LLC, do you give preference, you know, to, to those LLCs that are owned and managed by, you know, let's say Navajo, uh, Navajo owners, Navajo business owners, entrepreneurs. So again, this is just some of that. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but this is some of the stuff that we see. It can be very, very involved um, or it can be very simple. And one of the main provisions you want to have is how are you going to handle winding up and liquidating the business? What happens if you're the sole member of an LLC you know, and something were to happen on some unfortunate incident where you're not able to run your business anymore? Somebody might pass away. Somebody might end up in the hospital, might end up, you know, unresponsible. How is that handled? Again, operating agreement. Operating agreement will, uh, will break that down. And Swarovski, you're, there's a good question there. Who will be signing financial contracts for bank loans? Again, exactly. That's one of the main things that you put in the operating agreement. You might want to designate that to your, your CFO, right? So you might want to put in, uh, you know, the CFO has the sole responsibility to enter into contracts. Uh, with the bank and sign off on, on any kind of um, any kind of loan documents, something like that. And Aaron, yes, it is realistic to have one or two or three page operating agreement. Again, what a lot of, what I see a lot of people folks do is they actually go on the internet and they Google um, operating agreements, and you will get like stuff like Rocket Lawyer, right? That'll that'll allow you to just they'll give you a form, you know, a basic template for an operating agreement, and it says, here you go, here's an operating agreement. And yeah, that's okay to do. But just make sure you tailor those provisions to what you're doing with your business. Keep that in mind. And that's usually where, again, people come to my office and they say, I want an operating agreement. And they give me something they got off a rocket lawyer, you know, and they say, is this a good operating agreement? And I said, it depends. Does this actually reflect what you're doing in your business? If not, you need to revamp and redraft this whole thing. So keep that in mind. Okay. And then I see a question from Teresa. What is the advantage of having a separate business bank account for small businesses? What happens when you have a small business and you use your personal bank account? Again, when you're a sole proprietor, you can absolutely use your personal bank account. Most people do. In fact, in order to get a business account, you actually have to have an LLC in place to do that. Right. And so again, it, it depends on the nature of your business, but typically you want to separate your business assets with your personal assets. Otherwise you're doing something called co-mingling of assets which might be against the law in a lot of, a lot of uh, jurisdictions. You don't want to mingle your personal assets with your business assets. That, and again, it, it's, it might violate corporate policy and it might violate certain state laws out there depending on your jurisdiction. If you're an attorney like me, you are required to deposit any of the retainer agreements that you receive from your clients into a separate bank account. Otherwise, you're looking at getting uh, sanctioned by the Bar Association for commingling your assets with your client's assets. And so you have to have that kind of separation, again, not only for yourself, but for your clients as well. And to, and to make sure that you can actually do accurate accounting. If you have you know, your personal bank account with your, your business, your business uh, cash flows coming in, it's hard to separate those for purposes of doing accounting, right? When you're dealing with a lot of transactions, some folks have hundreds of transactions a day. So if you're trying to separate, you know, your grocery bill, you know, from bashes, you know, with your client who paid you on this date for this invoice, it's going to be very, very difficult. I don't recommend doing that. Um, again, you might be able to get away with it when you're a sole proprietor, but later on, I would highly recommend not doing that. And Carol, in general, can the agreement just state doing business with native owned instead of Navajo owned preference? Uh, yes. Again, the operating agreement is a, there's a lot of flexibility on how you draft that, right? It's a lot of flexibility. So you can, you can put a lot of stuff in that operating agreement, especially if it's just you, but if you're dealing with multiple members of the LLC, you might have to get their input on, on what you, what you're proposing to do. And every single person would typically have to sign off on that operating agreement. Now you can amend it, but typically that would require, again, um, 
everybody gives their their free and form consent on the amendments to that operating agreement, right? You got to have mutual consent to do that, signed and dated. So again, this is usually what you see at the end of an operating agreement. Again, multiple members. These are all the members signed, printed name, dated. Now it's an effective operating agreement. This is what's going to govern your company. Again, if there's any dispute, this will govern that dispute. And even some folks will have a choice of law statute in here for this one. And here's an example, governing law subject to section 11.4, this agreement will be governed first by Navajo law and then the laws of the state in which the articles of organization of the company have been filed. That's something to always consider when you're entering into contracts as a business. In the event of a breach of contract that you have with one of your clients or whoever you're doing business with, which court is going to solve that dispute, right? Where are you going to be sued? If you're, if you're a registered business in Navajo Nation, do you want to be sued in the state of Florida? Probably not. That's why it's important. When you, when you enter into contracts, always check the governing law of that contract, which, which law is going to be applied to construe that contract that you have with other businesses. You know, again, if you negotiate a business or a business contract in Navajo Nation, is Navajo law going to apply and in interpreting the terms of that contract? Again, if you're Navajo and you're Navajo business, most likely you want Navajo law to apply. Same thing if you're registered in the state of Arizona. You want Arizona law, law to apply because your attorney who drafted that contract, and hopefully you're not doing it yourself, your attorney who drafted that contract is going to draft it so that it's favorable to that state's laws, right? Now, if you get Florida law coming in, they're not going to interpret it the same way. Something to keep in mind. I always recommend contracts with any vendor, in-state or out-of-state. Um, so contracts, again, and then I did a whole separate uh, presentation on contracts, I actually recommended that, that Change Labs um, uh, have a, a presentation on that because that, that is a, a primary consideration for folks doing business. You will deal with contracts at some point. Unfortunately, it's not really part of my lecture here uh, and I don't wanna run out of time, but it's a whole separate, there's a whole uh, separate uh, uh, body of law that governs contracts, but it is a very interesting. So I'm just telling you the, the, the basis of it, just be aware of some of the stuff that goes into your contracts. Now, the low profit LLC, this is an interesting one. This is what I call the millennial business structure, right? Because, you know, my, I'm, I'm a millennial myself, right? And, and we, we, we have a unique way of thinking. Um, and I think the low profit LLC fits perfectly with our generation, right? And here is what a, a low profit LLC is. And, and this actually exists in Navajo Nation. And I've been getting a lot of questions about it. You know, what is a low profit LLC? Um, this is a business structure that is designed for entrepreneurs who seek to achieve a social mission and at the same time make a profit. It's structured very much like an LLC. You're going to have your operating agreement, articles of an organization, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the main difference between an LLC and a low profit LLC is profit motive. Typically, again, making a profit in a low profit LLC is subordinate it comes second to achieving some kind of social mission. And the main purpose of a low profit LLC is actually to open up investment capital that you can't do with an LLC, right? So with it, when you have an LLC, you can't have investors with an LLC, right? And so if people say, hey, I wanna invest in your business, well, that's really not a thing with an LLC uh, unless the person might become a member of your LLC, but you, know, you don't probably don't want somebody just, you know, anybody coming into your business who's saying, hey, I'll give you $10,000 if I could join your business, and then you give me a return on my investment. That's not the way LLCs were intended. Again, that's something that you would see with a C corporation. But with a low profit LLC, you can actually do something similar. And that's usually through private foundations, right? And so um, a private foundation, again, let me go to this slide here. Uh, a private foundation under the IRS regulations, a private foundation is required to give a minimum of 5% of their assets away each year. Now they do that in one of two ways, either through making a grant, uh, let's say to a nonprofit, or they can make an investment. The investments that they make, those are called PRIs, program related investments. And again, they make an investment so they can either make a profit on that investment or they can recoup their investment. But in order to make that investment, they have to meet three requirements in order to do that, the foundations. So um, the foundations basically have to show that uh, the investment they're making in that entity 
Uh, it has to, to be in line with their mission, their purposes. Um, it can't be to produce, the main purpose can't be to produce income or appreciate property. Um, and you can't be engaged in any kind of political or legislative uh, lobbying. So that's in order to make uh, a PRI. So here's the thing with the low profit LLCs, right? Is that low profit LLCs were geared towards private foundations. The people who, who designed the low profit LLC uh, designed it so that a private foundation would be able to make a investment in an LLC, right? And then again, the, the primary example of a private foundation is like Bill Gates, right? And Melinda Gates, their Millennium Gates Foundation. They actually have a PRI fund, which is somewhere around 400 million. And so if, the, if that foundation, the Gates Foundation, sees a low profit LLC that might match up with what they're doing in their foundation, they could possibly make an investment in that low profit LLC. And again, the amount can be 5,000, 10,000, or even a couple million if they wanted. Uh, that's the purpose of a low profit LLC. It was designed to give uh, private foundations an incentive to invest in a company that can also make a profit. So it's an in-between, between an LLC and a nonprofit. It has both aspects, but making a profit is not the primary purpose of the low profit LLC. So keep that in mind. And just because it means low profit or it says low profit LLC, that does not mean that you are limited in the income that that you can that, that, that you can make, right? Some people think, well, I have a low profit LLC. That must mean that I can't make above 5,000. That's not typically true. Uh, you can make you know, a profit over that. There's no income cap on a low profit LLC. And I know there's a lot of information in regards to, to the low profit LLC, and it's actually a very controversial, um, it's actually a very controversial business entity. And you don't see many. I think there might just be like less than 5,000 low profit LLCs in the United States, which is a very, very low number, right? Um, but again, here's the thing. Uh, the, this is where the catch comes in. A private foundation who might want to invest in a low profit LLC, they have to understand, and again, a lot of them, they do, that just because they invest in a low profit LLC does not mean that their investment is automatically considered a private, um, um, a PRI, right? It's not automatically considered a PRI under the IRS rules because the IRS has not enacted any legislation that says, hey, foundations, if you invest in a low profit LLC, that's automatically considered a PRI, right? That's the reason why a lot of foundations are hesitant to invest in a low profit LLC because there's no IRS regulations uh, behind it. And so if a foundation invests in a, in a low profit LLC and their investment is not considered a PRI, they run the risk of losing their tax exempt status, right? And the only way to ensure that the investment in the low profit LLC is actually a PRI is to obtain a letter from the IRS. It's called a private letter ruling that says, hey, uh, Gates Foundation, if you want to invest 50000 into Joe Austin's low profit LLC, then we will consider that a PRI uh, according to our private letter ruling. That's the only assurance that a foundation can get and to make sure their investment qualifies as a PRI. Again, if it doesn't, they lose their tax exempt status. And again, in order to get that private letter ruling from the IRS, it's a very costly endeavor to do that. There's a lot of legal fees involved in doing that. And it's just too much work for some private foundations. They'd much rather give that investment to a CDFI, right? Some kind of bank institution that gives lending to low income or disadvantaged communities. They'd much rather do that because again, that CDFI is gonna be a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit. And they don't have to worry about obtaining private letter rulings or you know, making sure their, their PRI qualifies as a PRI, none of that. That's, that's the main catch between, uh, for the low profit LLCs. But again, I have not seen anybody do this, but if, if I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to come to my office and say, I want to start a low profit LLC, uh, because I'd be interested in, in, in helping somebody do that. Um, and there are, again, there's only a handful of jurisdiction or states that actually allow you to form an L3C, L3C meaning low profit LLC. And these are the, the following states that you see on here, Illinois, Kansas, Louisiana, blah, blah, blah. We have Crow Nation that actually did it. Crow Nation is actually pretty progressive in some of their business laws. Um, Oglala Nation did it. And lo and behold, Navajo Nation as well. Navajo Nation. Uh, Navajo Nation enacted amendments to their Limited Liability Company Act. 
um, I can't remember when, but um, uh, the, the Navajo Nation amended their Limited Liability Company Act to allow people to start low profit LLCs. The president at the time uh, vetoed that legislation, but the council actually over, over uh, they overrided the veto by two thirds vote and they went ahead and added low profit LLC. I have not heard of any um, anybody out in Navajo Nation having a low profit LLC though. Uh, I, maybe there is, I don't know. Uh, but again, is this something that you're interested in? Only you can make that determination right, with your business plan. Um, Aaron, I don't think Arizona uh, allows for low profit LLCs. I, again, I could be wrong, but my last time I checked, I don't, I didn't see that Arizona allowed for that. Uh, but just because you have a low profit LLC in one jurisdiction, it doesn't mean that you can't get it recognized in another jurisdiction, which is a bit weird. But again, there's a, the whole legal explanation behind that. But typically, let's say that you're in one of the states that allows you to form a low profit LLC, like Maine. Um, you can actually go into another state, let's say Arizona, and still do business. You might, you're going to be considered a foreign entity, might be an LLC. Again, it, it's, it's a very gray area right now. Now, the, 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 last, the, the last part of my lecture, lions and tigers and bears, and th this is what I call the, the different corp corporate structures, right? B core, C core, and S core. What does all this stuff mean? Um, I'm not sure if anybody on this lecture or this presentation is interested in forming a C corporation. I think most folks here are probably just interested in sole proprietorship or you know, maybe an LLC. But if you're at the point when you're considering, you're considering going to a C corporation, you have to understand that a C corporation, again, it's a separate legal entity. Now, a C, a C corporation has a unique structure in itself, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. But a C corporation is, you know, again, the prime examples is, you know, the big companies that you see out there, right? Coca-Cola, uh, Microsoft, um, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, all of these are big corporations. And again, a corporation uh, can have an unlimited number of owners and it, they issue stock for their shareholders, right? They have shareholders, they issue different kinds of stock, they have a board of directors, all that kind of stuff. But the main purpose behind a C corporation is, is you're looking to raise venture capital, right? And you do that by issuing stocks. If you have some investors lined up, let's say that you have a business, you know, that is doing pretty well, or you're just in a position where you have like an angel investor who says, hey, look, you have a great business idea, uh, start a C corporation and I'll be one of your, your investors in that corporation. I can give you a million dollars in venture capital to get off the ground. Then that would be a primary example of when to start a C corporation, right? Um, keep in mind that in C corporation, we're always thinking taxes, right? There's two things that are certain in life. It's death and taxes. Always think about taxes. C corporation is subject to double taxation. What that means is that any profit that you make through your C corporation that's going to be taxed at the corporate level. The C corporation is taxed as an entity. This is not a pass-through entity, right? Like an LLC, where if you make a profit in LLC, all that profit, the income gets reported on your 1040, your individual tax returns, not a, not a C corporation. You're going to be paying taxes as a corporation at the corporate level on your profits. Now, if you have investors, and most of them will, I'm pretty certain most, you know, all corporations will have investors, uh, you, your investors, your shareholders, you have, if you want to pay dividends to your shareholders, right, on the profits that you make, any dividend that you pay to your shareholder, they have to pay taxes on their dividend. So not only is that profit taxed once at the corporate level, but when you distribute some of those profits as dividends to your shareholders, they have to pay taxes as well. That's what's called double taxation for C corporations. Here is an example of a corporate structure. And again, they're very, very involved, C corporations, right? There's a whole body of law that governs corporations in the United States. Every single state has a corporation code. Navajo Nation has a corporation code, right? This is the typical structure that you see in C corporations. Above all else, you have the shareholders. They're the ones who, who buy an interest in your company, right? And that interest is it manifests through you know, some kind of stock. It can be preferred stock, it can be common stock, depending on the type of stock. They might receive a dividend, a payout, or they might not. It depends on how you structure your, your, your stock classes. You know, you have different series of stock, you have different types of stock. 
you know, A series, B series, you know, different preferred common, all that kind of stuff. Again, that's all broken down in your corporate documents. But typically you have your shareholders and then you have your board of directors, right? Shareholders might elect the board of directors in that corporation. And then, and then underneath that, you have the CEO, the people who run the company, run the corporation, CEO, CFO, chief of operations, depending on how big the corporation is. And underneath them, you have your different regional offices. Again, when we think about a big corporation like, you know, Coca-Cola, offices everywhere, you know, multi-million dollar, you know, company or Tesla, you know, you're dealing with, you know, the stuff in the billions, right? Tesla Corporation. Those are huge corporations that we're talking about. Many shareholders, many board of directors. They're listed on, on the, the New York Stock Exchange, all that kind of stuff. That's what we're talking about, high-level corporate stuff. But you do not have to be that level in order to have a C corporation, right? Keep that in mind. Um, and also when we're dealing with corporations, you know, just so you all know, you know, again, you, you can, you can start your C corporation the same way you would an LLC. You, for instance, you go to the Arizona Corporation Commission website, you can file articles of incorporation and those articles of incorporation will basically be the document that establishes your corporation. Just like the articles of organization for an LLC, you have the articles of incorporation for corporations. And once that gets started, then what you want to do is you want to structure your corporation and you do that by drafting up bylaws, you know, the bylaws and the articles and the bylaws work together to form the structure of your corporation. Um, and then in addition to that, you might also have corporate policies. So those are some of the things that you have to keep in mind. Corporations, they're, they're, they're so large, they have a, their own kind of governing structures. That's what's called corporate governance. And so again, this is where a lot of people come to my office asking for you know, advice on corporate structures, corporate governance, and that kind of stuff. So that's something to keep in mind. The B Corporation. Now, this the B Corporation is interesting. Uh, B Corporation is actually a benefit corporation. There's really hard, there's almost no difference between a B Corporation and a C Corporation in terms of structure. The only difference is that a benefit corporation um, is that they have two purposes. Number one, to make a profit. And number two, they operate for the benefit of the public. So it's kind of similar to a low profit LLC, but the B Corporation, again, focuses on the public good. And this, the reason why they do this is, again, in this day and age, you know, a lot of folks, investors are wanting to invest in companies that have uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, responsibility to the public at large. And this is one of the first questions that, you know, I, I addressed at the start of this presentation, right, is corporate responsibility. You know, when you're a large corporation, you know, you have a responsibility ethically to the public out there to do business the right way. And so that's what the, pur the purpose of a benefit corporation is, right, is to, to pursue some kind of purpose that benefits everyone. And that attracts, you know, a lot of investors who are looking to invest in companies that focus on the public at large. And there's over 35 states that will allow for the formation of B corporations. In fact, you can actually obtain a certification to become a B corporation. Um, and that's done through B Lab. And there's the link down there. Uh, and you just Google B Lab or B, B corporation certification, you'll come across it. Uh, and then we're coming up on the last few slides here S corporation. S corporation is not a business structure. Remember that. S corporation is a tax status. And there is a lot of laws and reasons why you should consider this. When you start growing your LLC, you might want to elect to be taxed as an S corporation rather than a disregarded or passed through entity. And again, if you have questions about this, you can give me a call. I can talk to you, but this is a big conversation to have. I always recommend that, you know, when you start making, let's say a couple hundred thousand dollars, depending on your services or products or your company, you might want to consider electing S corporation status for purposes of taxes, because that will significantly, well, not significantly, but a large part, it will reduce your overall taxes that you have to pay. Um, and that's something, again, that, that we advise uh, companies on when they ask our, our office for help. Um, you can elect to be a S corporation if you're a C corporation, but I would highly recommend you, you talk to a tax, uh, tax expert on that before you do that. There's tons of considerations. The nonprofit, primary example, Change Labs, right? Change Labs, 501c3 nonprofit, domestic nonprofit in Arizona. They're also uh, registered in New Mexico, Utah. So this is a primary example of a nonprofit. Again, keep in mind that when you start a nonprofit organization, 
that does not mean that you're automatically tax exempt. You have to file what's called a form 1023 with the IRS in order to obtain tax exempt status for your nonprofit. So remember that. Um, and with that, that pretty much concludes my presentation. I'm not sure if we have time for any questions, uh, but you know, I wanna thank you all for listening to my presentation. I hope you learned something. And you know, again, if you have any questions, I have my contact information here. Feel free to reach out to my law office. Um, you know, we sometimes we're able to do conference consultations for free. It might require, you know, some some uh, uh, to tack on some legal fees. But you know, again, so I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, Raquel, I'll give it back to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, were we able to get through all the questions in the chat box? If anybody has a question, they can um, let me know. Last of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Austin for speaking today. It was a lot of really, really great information. I know that I learned a lot of stuff today and I'm sure that the rest of us are all walking away with a lot of really, really valuable information. Like Teresa was saying in the comments that this isn't information that just easily accessible. You would have to know where to look exactly <laughs> to find all that. So thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> um, for our audience members, Thank you again for being here today and thank you for all your questions and your participation. It definitely makes the conversation a lot more fun and interesting. Um, and if you miss any part of Mr. Austin's presentation today, Change Labs will have this session um, posted very soon to our YouTube channel. So definitely keep an eye out for that. It should be up by the end of the week. And if you missed any of my portion of today's session um, about Change Labs, and are interested in any services that we offer, feel free to reach out to me. My email is here or visit our website at nativestartup.org. And the very last announcement is our next workshop, which is gonna be in two weeks from now, August 10th. We will have another speaker, attorney speaker, Tata Atone. She'll be speaking on the uh, registering your business with your state, federal and local communities, um, such as your EIN, uh, role addressing, TPT, etc. So if you're interested in that information, stay tuned. Um, I will have the registration link available very, very soon, uh, most likely by tomorrow. But if there's no further questions, oh, I do see Miranda's, what's the YouTube channel called? If you go to YouTube site and look up Change Labs, um, we'll have our, it's under the word Change Labs or the phrase Change Labs. Austin or Joseph, there is a question from Jesse. It says, how does business insurance work on the res? I'm not sure if that. Uh, let's see. That's a huge topic. <laughs> yeah. um, hey, Je Jesse, feel free to, to reach out to me on that because we, we do, you know, help people try to get a, who are trying to get insurance on, on the reservation. Uh, and that that's that's another thing that needs to be addressed. There's a gap in that too. There's a lot of insurance companies who actually are hesitant to, to insure businesses on the reservation, but there's some out there who are willing to do it. And then we have a question as well from Baleen. Is business owner's insurance worth it? It depends. Um, again, uh, feel, feel free to, to reach out to me on that because uh, those are pretty big topics and, and discussions to be had. Uh, but yeah, it all depends uh, on that. Depends on the nature of your business and what you're doing and whatnot. So Awesome. It looks like that's the last of our... And everybody else still here, there's his email if you have any further questions for him. And again, thank you, Joseph, so much for being here today. Yep. I really enjoyed the session. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys all have a great day, and we will see you guys next time. Bye.